don't get loaded already. Can we make welcome to this pulpit, Miss Lydia Marlowe? Come on, give Jesus praise. Come on. Come on, invasion, lift up a shout. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, sit down. For a minute, anyway. You know, the last time I preached in this pulpit, I got sat down for months. This was the last place I preached before COVID-19 shut down the planet. And for the next six months, I preached from the waist up in a Shake the Nation shirt and from the waist down in basketball shoe shorts with no shoes on because Florida, praise God. Um, so I just wanna say, don't y'all do that again. I don't know who went off their prayer watch, but it hadn't been fun. Knock it off. So. Um, I also want to say that as long as there's breath in my lungs for the rest of my life, um, I'm going to be Keith Taylor's friend. You know why? Because some of y'all the apostle of this or that, and that's great. And uh, I appreciate real apostles. That's good because I've met fake ones, and that's not fun. Um, but, 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 but Keith Taylor is the apostle of mayhem. Everywhere dude goes, he's just wreaking havoc every which way. And I found out last year at the altar time when that one chick went swinging from my face because she had a demon in her. We got that thing out. But I tell you what, I found out real fast that if you want to cast out a devil, you want Keith Taylor on your team. <laughs> He's over my left shoulder going, Wah! Come out! No, I'm sorry. I'm not even sure what's happening, but this rocks. But, um... I want to complain about two things before I start whatever this is going to be. Um, first of all, I have to follow John Kilpatrick. That's not fair. <laughs> and Michael Eifengood. That's also not fair. Second thing I want to complain about is all the rest of y'all look cute and y'all headshots on the poster. I look like I'm fixing to punch somebody. <laughs> like, <laughs> leave it to the only chick on the preaching schedule to look like I'm fixing to throw a punch. But you know what? Last year I felt a little bit sorry for you because a lot of you was the first time. But you know what? <clears throat> It is what it is now, baby. <laughs> so just, you know, buckle up or don't. Here we go. Um, on the front row this morning, I came in here and I should have known better than to come into this house and run my stupid mouth. Do y'all ever get in trouble? Yeah. If you, you know that if you don't have a Holy Ghost that gets you in trouble sometimes, you don't have the one from the Bible, right? <laughs> Do we need to preach that for a minute or y'all good? <laughs> and on the front row, I came in here thinking I was gonna do one thing, told Pastor Karen, man, I even think I know what I'm preaching. I'm, I remarked about that because it makes a change. Every other time I'm anywhere, I never do know, but this morning I thought I knew. I'm a moron, did you know that? <laughs> I'm sitting down there in the middle of worship, I heard the Holy Ghost say, this is a divine interruption. So I don't know what you expect this morning. I will tell this afternoon, whatever time it is. Um, did y'all pack snacks? Are you okay? Cause I love you, boo boo, but I ain't gonna cut it short to make you feel better. I'm just not gonna do it. It's not gonna happen. If you don't know enough about revival by now to bring a protein bar in your bag, you're dumber than a 10 pound sack of stupid. claim to have been in revival since 2010. If you don't know about protein bars by now, somebody needs to give you the revelation. Be activated. <laughs> the Lord's been dealing with me about something. It's been in the crock pot of my soul. I don't know what else is going to happen in here. I believe this will be much more prophetic than it will be uh, sermony. But you people are all crazy. So whatever. Plus, whatever I say can't be that weird because David Craig called you all sissies on the first night. <laughs> like, man, you're making my life a little easier, you know? <laughs> but I believe... If I had been in charge of when a transition-ish thing would occur, 
in this outpouring, I would have chosen last year on the decade mark. That's what I would have done. But as usual, God didn't ask me. <laughs> Do y'all wish God would ask you stuff? Lord, I wish he'd ask me some stuff. I wish he'd let me hold the zap button for a few minutes. <laughs> you know he's got one, come on. <laughs> I just wanna, I don't know what the theological term for that is, life and good, you can straighten me out later. But, but I just wanna hold the zap button for a few minutes, there would soon be a blessed change. <laughs> I do, you want world peace? Watch this, boom, you know? <laughs> God didn't ask me when the transition would occur. But I came to announce to you by the Holy Ghost, it's the 11th year. Whew, did you feel that? I said it's the 11th year. There is something about this season that God is bringing order to, to what, is, what is occurring so that what can occur, what is happening, will be sustained. Yeah. I think Michael Leifengood said that about 65 times. It's great for something to happen, but the problem that we have is if we hop in the car right now, how many of y'all got touched at Brownsville? Did anybody get touched at the bay? Okay, here's the thing. We can drive our cars down there right now. Ain't nobody there. I'm not mad at anybody. It's great for something to be happening, but I believe God is beginning to bring some order and some clarity so that what is occurring can survive the passing of the baton, can be sustained to future generations. Because as I said last year, and as I've screamed everywhere I've been ever since, we owe the next generation a move of God. So if what's happening in here right now feels hot off the press, it's because I've been scribbling so fast. But I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles. When I tell you where, you're not going to think it's a revival preach, but it is. The book of Numbers. I know. I wouldn't have picked that either. Once again, I say unto you, he didn't ask me. By the way, you should read the Old Testament from time to time. A lot of good stuff in there. You should read the whole book. Some of y'all, that'd be a change. Praise God. I would consider it revival in America if we could just have a revival of saying what God said. Come on, worship pastors, of singing what God's word says. Come on. Numbers chapter 9. You want a title? I don't know. This is so hot off the hot griddle that I am sitting on right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm calling this the marching orders of the vanguard. Yeah, Numbers chapter 9, verse 15. Now on the day that the tabernacle was erected, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And in the evening, it was like the appearance of fire over the tabernacle until morning. So it was continuously. Did everybody see that? So it was continuously. The cloud would cover it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was lifted from over the tent, afterward, the sons of Israel would then set out. Is anybody reading this with me? And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the sons of Israel would camp. At the command of the Lord, the sons of Israel would set out. And at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the cloud settled over the tabernacle, they remained camped. Even when the cloud lingered over the tabernacle for many days, the sons of Israel would keep the Lord's charge and not set out. Sometimes, if the cloud remained, sometimes a few days over the tabernacle, according to the command of the Lord. Are y'all getting the picture? They remained camped. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. If sometimes the, camp, the cloud remained from evening until morning, when the cloud was lifted in the morning, they would move out. Or if it remained in the daytime and at night, whenever the cloud was lifted, they would set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a year, I feel the Holy Ghost, that the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it. The sons of Israel remained camped and did not set out. But when it was 
was lifted, they did set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. And at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the Lord's charge according to the command of the Lord through Moses. Are y'all having fun? Can I read a couple more verses? Y'all know my rule. You stay quiet. We preach longer. Chapter 10, verse 1, the Lord spoke further to Moses, saying, Make yourself two trumpets of silver. Of hammered work you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for having the camp set out. When both are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Yet if only one is blown, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall assemble before you. But when you blow an alarm, the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, I ask you to do that which only you can do. Father, I ask you to give us divine prophetic instruction in this house this morning. Give your servant boldness so that at your word, the name of Jesus might be magnified and signs and wonders will verify the preaching of the word in Jesus' name. Amen. The marching orders of the vanguard. See... I know, we read a lot. I know. Does you good, though. It's good for you. A vanguard, I wore my military jacket for y'all. Because look at what this conference is called. Forward March. I, just recently, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me about that word, vanguard. And I, honestly, I'm going to be real with you. Brother Charles, I had to go get my dictionary app up. I didn't know what God was talking about. My daddy's a preacher. He did not serve in the armed services, so I don't have any earthly idea what a vanguard is. I had to look it up. Watch this. Are y'all ready? Don't make me come down there. (laughs) Vanguard. It is the foremost division or the front part of an army, the advanced guard. One more time. You ready? The vanguard is the foremost division or the front part of an army. It is the advanced guard. Listen to me in here today. Somebody has to go first. I said somebody has to go first. I love the five-fold ministry. I love how God uses every gift together. I love how in this movement up here, it is so interlocked and flows effortlessly. But let me tell you something, baby. Apostle is as apostle does. Prophet is as prophet does. Somebody's got to go first. Where is the vanguard? Where's the forward advance team? And we find in the passage that we just read and in other areas in the Old Testament, we find that God had a very specific way in which Israel was to live their life in the wilderness. Let me talk about the wilderness for two seconds. Because some of y'all want to skip out on your wilderness season because you don't know what's being served up on the platter. You see, you want to skip that part because you perceive it to be difficult. Well, welcome to big girl church. You don't get to wear pull-ups or depends up in here. It's time to put your big girl panties on. Welcome to big church. My boy says to me, he's five years old. Y'all, you know, pray for us. And um, we can't bring him yet. Malachi just turned five. Jeremiah's two and a half. We can't bring him yet because Jeremiah will be swinging from the chandeliers. Give us another year. We'll see what we can do, okay? <laughs> But I asked Malachi the other day, I said, are you going to come here, Mama, preach? He came with us on a trip. You going to come here, Mama, preach? He said, I can't come to grown-up church. (laughs) He said, Mama, of course I don't want to go to grown-up church. I want to go to the kids' church. You and Daddy are not allowed to come to kids' church. You have to go to grown-up church. (laughs) My children are punks. What do you want from me? The problem with some of y'all is you don't want to come to grown-ups church 
you still want to play and splash around on the edge of the river. You don't want to go deeper. If you go to grown-up church, you might get grown-up responsibility. If you get a real anointing, if you get a real gifting, if you get a real mandate from heaven, you might be expected to be responsible and accountable for it. It's time to come to Big Girl Church. There was a specific way that Israel was to camp in the wilderness. Let's talk about the word wilderness. In Hebrew, the word for wilderness, you can check me out. Go to Exodus 3 when you get home. When Moses went to the wilderness and saw the burning bush, the word that is used there is called midbar. It's closely related to the word dabar. I'm probably not saying that right. Ask Eric later. <laughs> Eric's the only guy I know that's as nerdy as me. Praise God. <laughs> we just get blessed by dictionaries and concordances and encyclopedias. But Dabar is the Hebrew word for speech, word, utterance. It, it is when God talks, Dabar. Midbar is so closely related to that word, we get our word wilderness for it. But the primary definition, you know how dictionaries order de definitions? Yeah, the secondary definition for midbar is wilderness. The primary definition for midbar is speech. You didn't get it. If you are called to the wilderness, it's because you're about to hear his voice. It is because he is about to speak. You go to the wilderness not to whine about how dry it is, but to hear the voice of the one who burns in the burning bush. As they camped in the wilderness, every movie I've ever seen just had them all hanging out. A lot of tents everywhere. Chaos. God don't do that, Apostle. There was no chaos. There was order in the camp. Because the order was a demonstration. See, they, they, they couldn't just put their tent where they wanted to. They all, every tent in the community had to face the tabernacle. That's why Brother Michael will never be allowed to not preach presence. Because it doesn't matter what else we preach if we're not camped toward the presence. The Mishkan, what, the, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, it was the place where the glory burned day and night, night and day between the, cher the cherubim over the mercy seat. And in that there was perpetual presence in the Holy of Holies. And everywhere that tent was relocated to, everyone had to recalibrate their whole life to it. That's why I will say to you, if you are still waiting for revival to be convenient to your little schedule, you have not seen revival yet. If you think you've seen the glory, but it hasn't cost you something, you haven't seen the real glory. I'll go so far as to say this. If you haven't prayed that prayer that Brother Michael talked about, God, don't let me live if you're not going to show your glory again. If you haven't prayed that prayer, you are not yet hungry for real revival. Oh. Amen, Lydia. Yeah. Every tent faced his presence. Cloud by day, fire by night. But even that, there was order in it, and that's because I'm telling you, it was a demonstration. On each side of the tabernacle, of the tent, a division of the Levites was represented. On the north, on the south, and on the west, the three divisions of the Levites were represented at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Moses' family and Aaron's family camped there. So the the congregation, the tent was surrounded by guardians, custodians of the presence of the Lord. But then watch it now. Every other tribe camped in order in groups of three. To the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. Each division, each direction had three tribes. Are, is this okay? Y'all all right? Y'all looking at me a little bit funny right now. I don't know if you can see it. But we've got the tent, and we've got groups of three, north, south, east, and west, which means that as the, the tribes advanced 
through the wilderness with presence at the center, if you flew a drone camera up above the encamp encampment of Israel into the atmosphere and looked down and took some photographs of that camp, what you would see was presence at the center and the pattern of the cross. I'm about to make everybody mad right here. You ready? <laughs> Buckle up, boo-boo. You want to tell me that you're experiencing the glory? Well, baby, if all your experience is at gold dust and feathers, but you ain't preached the cross, you are not experiencing the glory. You have gotten weird and flaky and spooky. If your life is really camped around the presence, the cross is what we see. history book you want to. There's no such thing as a revival apart from a repentance message. You can't have one without the other. You camp around the presence it looks like something. When God gave divine prophetic instruction the cross is what the world saw. I said apostolic is as apostolic does. Come on. Come on. <laughs> what I love about this group of people is that the more you press in to outpouring, the less you seem to care about your individual ministries. The more it becomes all about Jesus. I love that. It, I love that. That's how I know something real is happening in the room. I'm not going to deal with all 12 tribes. We not going to stay all day, even though Michael Life and Good is being tempted. But I tell you what, I've been told that if I preach good today, I can have burritos for dinner. <laughs> so I don't know what you people are doing, but I'm about to earn my tacos in Jesus' name. <laughs> if you have Jesus in Mexican food, you're having a mighty outpouring, my friend. <laughs> you, you throw in a cup of coffee and this is like heaven to me, okay? <laughs> we'll go all day. No, we won't. We'll be good. Maybe. Kind of. Sort of. I have to be somewhat good because my mama's watching right now. So, <laughs> Hi, Mom. Okay. I won't deal with all 12 tribes. You could break this down a thousand different ways. There's so much there. <laughs> what I love about the Old Testament is every time you break it down, you see Jesus just waving between every line. I love it. But the tribe that camps... The, the, the group of tribes that camp toward the east, they are the vanguard tribes. Because every time that trumpet sounded, I just read it to you, the tribes that camped to the east were the ones that moved first. We think north, south, east, west. God always begins with east. The, caber the, the tabernacle was set up facing the east. Everything about God, it was east first. So the tribes to the east of the temple, they were the vanguard tribes. You know what tribes they were? Eric, shut up, I know you know. <laughs> they were the tribes of Judah, the tribe of Zebulon, and the tribe of Issachar. These three tribes were the vanguard collective. I, I'm, I'm going to just take my time, just a second. Let's break each one of those down. I want you to know what causes forward progress. Because, because the vanguard is what achieves forward progress. I'll give it to you like this. Um, you know what? You might be impressed with, with, with a quarterback in the NFL. Be sure it's the right one, though, because the one punk that just won the Super Bowl, he credited his win with his wife's witchcraft. So don't select that guy as your favorite because he's a punk. Just trust me on this. I can't even, I can't even. I like to watch a good football game. And you might be impressed with a quarterback for how far he can throw a football, but a quarterback, it doesn't matter how awesome he is, that man is useless without the offensive line. That man is not gonna get to throw a football if there ain't a vanguard saying, now nah, we're gonna make forward progress right here. So these three tribes collectively marched under the banner of Judah. Even though the, there were three tribes, 
Judah, Zebulon, Issachar, they all three marched under the banner of Judah. I've been doing some research on this. Some research suggests that it was a flag with a lion on it. Suggested that other tribes had the flag of a man. Other tribes had the face of an ox. And the other had a face of an eagle. I don't know. I can't prove that. And I don't know if they can either. But it sure would make a lot of sense if you read Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4, right? Whether, whatever the flag looked like, those three tribes marched under the banner of Judah. Collectively, we see in those tribes God's understanding of what praise accomplishes. Okay, it's okay to go a little bit deeper today. Okay, because when I say praise, I don't want you, I mean, look, these guys rock it, and I like that. Whoa, I like that. It's just fun. I like it. They're doing great. But I need you to get it out of the happy, clappy zone for a minute and understand that it's a lot more than that. Praise has, has an extraordinary ability. I'm talking about things that bring forward progress. Are we all right? And I promise you, this is the stuff that gets you out of your wilderness and into your inheritance. You cannot go there unless the vanguard advances. Forward, march. Come on, y'all. You cannot move into your inheritance unless the vanguard advances. Okay, the vanguard, Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, let's take each of those names. You know as well as I do that Judah means praise, yes? See, I've yelled it all over the world for such a long time. I need you. Pull that understanding out of the music box for just a moment. Praise is a vibrant, vocal, very usually quite violent expression of God's reputation being proclaimed back to him. Now, haha, here we go. Worship can only be vertical. Do you understand? When you say prophetic worship and all you're doing is singing over people, you just prophetic singing. That ain't worship. Because worship is only vertical. Amen, somebody? Somebody told me I wasn't being prophetic enough in my worship one time. I said, well, I just sang Revelation 4. It don't get a lot more prophetic than that, boo. (laughs) What do you want from my life? What they meant is you didn't prophesy to me. I don't come to talk to you in worship. I'm talking to the king. I know, I know I must be having fun because I'm T.D. Jake sweating now, praise God. I feel like that's cuter when you're a dude, but when you're a chick, it ain't funny. I just want to say I never sweat like this before I started working for Nathan Morris. They did not put that in the employee handbook, okay? I'm just going to say that right now. Anyway. No, while worship can only be vertical, only address him eyes to eyes, ears to ears, straight on. You understand? Praise has an extraordinary ability to be both vertical and horizontal at the same time. Who supplies all of my needs. I give you praise because you are Jehovah Jireh. I've never lacked one good thing. And in 2020, when we didn't get to go preach anywhere, so no preaching, no offering. Come on, come on. There was not one time that we missed one bill. There was not one time that my boys went hungry. Because my vertical praise to him enforces his reputation on my circumstances. The reason praise is prophetic is because sometimes, you want me to tell you what's funny? Sometimes you preach sick, don't you? It's not a good idea these days, but back in the day, you know, before everybody went crazy. (laughs) Nobody wants a prayer line now, right? (laughs) I preached last year. When I stood in this pulpit and preached mine the gap, I had a temperature. I don't think it was the Rona because I could still taste my Mexican food, so I think we're good. (laughs) But I stood in the pulpit and demanded that sickness leave bodies, and it did. Why? 
because my praise to the Lord as Jehovah Rapha, the healer, imposed his reputation on people in the room. So it didn't matter what was wrong with me. Y'all just got healed. Praise God, everybody. Praise is vertical and horizontal at the same time. That is why one of my favorite ways to praise the Lord is to go into what I call opposite mode. Y'all want to whine and cry and call somebody and say, oh, you just don't know what I'm going through. Uh Uh-uh. I get in my house and say, I'm going to do this in totally the opposite of what the devil's trying to do for me. So if we're under attack, I start singing, you are the mighty warrior and I give you praise. If my health is under attack, I say, you are the healer and I give you praise. If it's our finances, I say, you never, ever let the righteous be forsaken. And I give you praise. Praise is the head of the vanguard. You cannot praise and whine at the same time. That's why more of y'all don't do it. Oh, come on, somebody. Some of y'all are still so dependent on your worship team to sing your favorite song. If I could just get you to take a position and proclaim a praise into your own life, you'll see a change that a fire tunnel won't bring you. An impartation will put on you. You will introduce the, the reputation of Jesus through the gateway of your mouth. I said praise is the head of the vanguard. She ain't waiting on y'all to get it. Hallelujah. 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 (laughs) The vanguard, the foremost division or front part of an army, the head of the vanguard, the front line of the front line is praise. That's why, (laughs) that's why somebody told me one time, they watched me lead worship. I don't get to do that a lot anymore. I don't know what the heck God's up to making me preach a lot. I guess y'all are coming under judgment or something. (laughs) It wasn't an ambition I had, I promise you that. You know, when when the Bay Revival was going, I never got any hate mail. Did you know that? John Kilpatrick and Nathan Morris just got loads of it. Nobody hated me. You know why? Because I wasn't saying nothing. You come out from behind that keyboard and everybody got an opinion about everything you say. And they put it all up to the Facebook. Honey, I know how to delete. Do not send me none of that junk. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) We ran into more folk that knew how to have a revival that had never had one in their life. Praise God. I know nobody like that's in Indiana, though. It's okay. God was watching me lead worship and he said, I'm a Marine, ma'am. I said, all right. I'm thinking, dude, I ain't making you mad. All right. Them Marines, man, they'll chew you up and spit you right on out. Kill you seven ways before you knew you was dead. I ain't messing with that guy. He said, you know, Semper Fi, boo, I'm good. I'm like, I said, uh, well, what did you want to talk to me about, bro? He said, when you lead worship, I've never seen anything like it. You take a fighter stance. He said, ma'am, I know a fighter when I see one. You take a fighter stance. And I thought, well, if that just ain't the most Second Chronicles 2020 thing I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) See, the vanguard is the part of the army that advances first. This is why all throughout the word of God. Did you know in the text of this conference, Judah, David is of the tribe of? So it is Judah that went and listened for the marching in the bushes. Come on, y'all. It is Judah that advanced first. That is the passage that unlocked the name of the Lord that we never knew before. The Lord is our breakthrough. Oh, I know some of y'all heard me talk about praise before. I'm going to do it again. Judah means praise. Judah had a son called Perez. Perez means breakthrough. It is your praise that produces your breakthrough. But all throughout the word of God, anytime God wanted his armies to advance, one of his favorite things to say was, send Judah first. What's he saying? Let the vanguard advance. If you'll sing to me my favorite song and move forward while you do it, I'll send my armies to fight for you. This is God's idea of a military strategy. Y'all okay? How long have I been going? Is it okay? Okay. 
Maybe now would be a good time to tell y'all that Apostle said he don't care how long I go. <laughs> Who wants your offering back now? <laughs> no returns. <laughs> you should have read the terms and conditions. <laughs> Let's talk about Zebulon. I saw this, it absolutely blew my face off. I get more glory in my study. <laughs> Nathan's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I'm playing with the dictionary again. He's like, you're such a freak. <laughs> he goes, go on then, have fun. <laughs> Watch it. Zebulon means exalted dwelling. Wow. Habitation. Praise. Yes, it produces breakthrough. But as we progress into praise, what we find is that praise creates, cultivates, establishes a dwelling that couldn't help but be exalted. In Psalm 22, I think somewhere around verse 3-ish, David said, yet you are holy, you who are enthroned upon the praises of your people. Can we talk about that for just a minute? When we talk about the throne of God in the Western ear, if I say to you the throne of God is established, you think the throne doesn't move. You think the throne cannot move. Everybody just looked at me like I'm about to preach heresy. Calm down. <laughs> Breathe, everybody. Some of y'all honey just got tight. <laughs> you think the throne can't move. When we say that the throne is established, what we mean is that there is no competition for the throne of God. Nobody... The, do you understand that he did not even sit up off that throne to kick the devil's hind parts out of heaven? He just had some punk angel take care of that. The throne of God is established, meaning that there is no competition for the one whose eyes burn like a flame of fire. The throne is established. Nobody can pull him off of it. You did not vote for him. You cannot impeach him, and he will never resign. There's no competition for the throne. You might have politics in your denomination, baby, but there's no politics in the kingdom because God's not running for nothing and he's not going to observe a term limit. The throne is established. I feel the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I wish more of y'all would preach drunk. It'd be a lot more fun. Let me say for the online people, I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I don't drink nothing in, in, in the natural, but in the Holy Ghost, I'm a drunk waiting to happen. Praise <laughs> God. Somebody told me at the bay I needed to get my sea legs. I said, uh-uh. If the Lord went to all the trouble to knock me over, don't you bother trying to pick me up. <laughs> Couple of punks. <laughs> I got an assistant worship leader and she does a magnificent job. Y'all have a good night. Watch it now. The throne is established. There's no competition for the throne. But the throne does move. In ancient times, thrones had wheels. <laughs> you see, Nebuchadnezzar took over the whole kingdom of Judah by rolling his throne right into the city gate of Jerusalem. In ancient times, thrones had wheels. Can I tell you right now? When Ezekiel, when he saw the glory, he saw a man on fire. He said, from the waist up, he was a man on fire. From the waist down, he was fire. And he was seated on a throne. And there was glory all around him, cherubim all around him. But then Ezekiel said, I saw wheels in the middle of wheels. The throne of God is established. There's no competition. But baby, there are wheels on that throne. And it is your praise that causes the wheels to turn. Oh! I remember. Whoa, I feel God in here. This is fun, Steve Pulpit. Never call him by his name again. Let me tell you something. 
I knew I was going to like cross tab a thousand years ago. Come in here. Everybody crazy. I appreciate that because I got my own level of crazy. And crazy is just crazy does. All real revival folk are a little nuts. So I felt right at home. Apostle Keith getting up doing his James Brown impression. I was like, well, praise God. I mean, I'm from Augusta. I can get down with that. Wow, let's go. <laughs> Augusta is the home of James Brown, y'all. I do, in fact, feel good. Da -na 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 -na. <laughs> well, we're standing on the front row. The praise was awesome. Everybody's going nuts. It was great. But the whole room shifted and somebody starts singing. There is none like thee. What happened? What happened? Watch it. In any given service, you can experience this. The, we, we will say, some speaker will get up with a microphone and say, the room shifted. It's not, that, it's, it's not just only about atmospheres. Please understand, the reason you sensed a change is because your praise caused the throne to move in. Far be it from me to try and enhance what John Kilpatrick has said, because he's John Kilpatrick, and the rest of us can play at this all we want to, but we're not going to beat Papa, right? Right? I mean, there's just a level, and he's the bishop. That's how it goes. But I would add to what he said this. You usher the glory in and everything changes. When you usher the glory in, it's the throne moving in. The authority of heaven is tangibly felt. And in that moment, listen, I love y'all. I've heard folk say, oh, the glory's here. Reach up and pull down. Look, look, knock it off. The glory's here. The authority of heaven has manifested. Be still and let him do what he does. The vanguard. Judah goes first. But under the flag of Judah, here comes the exalted dwelling. Here comes Zebulon. These are two of the three vanguard tribes. They're the offensive line. Come on, y'all. Forward progress. I'm, I'm almost, I don't really know what I am, okay? I, almost, I started to say I'm almost done. I'm not really sure. If you don't like this message, I wanted to preach something else. So I'm with you. I had all my little stuff together, really pretty notes. I am literally reading out of scribbles that I made on the front row with a Sharpie because Jesus said, this is a divine interruption. So, but I never did go to school to preach homiletics anyway. I went to BRSM to study leading worship. And the preaching professor said, would you please, please come to homiletics class? And I said, why do I need that? I'm a worship pastor. Anyway, I emailed that guy a few years ago to tell him I was an idiot. <laughs> so technically, I don't even know what I'm doing right now when it comes to preaching. But you know, maybe you should consider <laughs> professionals built the Titanic. <laughs> Amateurs built the art, baby. I don't know about you, boo-boo, but my heart will go on the boat that still floats. That's all I'm saying. We don't do those dumb little Apple CEO church talks anyway. What a load of crap those end up being, my Lord. You don't like it that I said crap? Lucky for you, this is the last session of the conference. If you can wait just a few more minutes, you're almost done. <laughs> but don't you get up and leave while I preach or I'll chase you out that door. <laughs> <laughs> the last tribe. I, I, I'm having a good time. How y'all feel? Nothing to be mad about. I'm semi-drunk. The Holy Ghost has been moving in here this morning. I get burritos tonight. There's nothing wrong with my life. <laughs> 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 
My mom has had four heart attacks in the course of this message though back at home, so I'm sorry, mom, I love you. <laughs> if you think I'm fun though, y'all couldn't handle my mama, man. She is extra. <laughs> I'm bringing them next year, I'm doing it. Oh, by the way, I wanted y'all to know I was coming whether they invited me or not. <laughs> Just... I, I, I didn't have to do nothing, but there ain't no way y'all gonna have parties like this and I ain't gonna come. That's just the way it is. Final tribe of the vanguard was the tribe of Issachar. And I know exactly what reference you just jumped to. Yes, they were men who discerned the times and knew what Israel should do, yes. But that tribe, I need you to hear it, I need you to understand it. That tribe marched under the banner of praise. <laughs> under the banner of praise, flows discernment. I just need somebody to catch that one. If you're not seeing what is happening right now in the world around you, if you are struggling with clarity for your family, for your ministry, for your church, my friend, I would submit to you, you are not praising enough. I didn't say you're not singing enough. I said you're not praising enough. Because the ability to see occurs when you release God's reputation through your mouth. A verse that has a major grip on my family. It actually predates my marriage to Nathan. I'm glad I got to bring him this time too. I'm sure I preach better when he's here. I'm just gonna tell you. <laughs> If you single in the room, I'm living proof that Jesus can't import. <laughs> and if you ain't got nothing but bubbles in your church, just hold on, baby. God sent somebody right over the Atlantic for me. <laughs> It'll be all right. But a major scripture that's had roots in my soul since 2004, 2005. In the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 18, it said, Then you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves me and the one who does not. But that kind of visionary discernment occurs when you're under the banner of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Is it okay to go in a little bit deeper? You all right? I looked up the name Issachar. Y'all ain't gonna even believe this. I'm not gonna tell you the truth. I love you so much, but I'm gonna preach myself happy whether y'all like this or not. Cause if nothing else is blessing me right now, this is the kind of junk that makes me go screaming in my house. Y'all ready? <laughs> the name Issachar means there is a recompense. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, no, no, no. You gotta see it with me. You gotta see it with me. Under the banner of praise, as the vanguard moves forward, the Lord reminds you that to those who diligently seek him, there is a reward, there is a payment, there is a reimbursement. Oh my Lord, there's a reimbursement. But watch it now, watch it now. The recompense is two part. To those who diligently seek God, there is a reward, a recompense. That's the one that comes from heaven. It's always more than enough. It's always over the top. We ain't got no money, but we bless folk. You know what I mean? We can't make any sense out of it. Nobody can understand how God, Nathan said yesterday, favor ain't fair, but that don't make it wrong. You know, God just does stuff. We don't even know what happens and stuff happens. That's the repayment for being a diligent seeker of God. That's one part of the recompense. But I'm about to shout right now. Because every time the devil touches your stuff, every time the devil touches your family, please try not to hear this. I, I'm not ashamed of talking about money, and I appreciate that, but please try not to hear it only in that category. Every time the devil touches your legacy, every time he messes with your babies, every time he messes with your ministry or your church, the Bible says that when the thief, when you catch the thief stealing, that clown has to pay back up to double, and in some cases, seven times greater than what he put his hand on. There is a recompense! A 
I said there is a recompense. Oh, hallelujah. I don't go strutting and I don't get arrogant with it, but let me tell you. Every time the devil messes with my stuff, every time he tries to put his hand on one of my boys, every time he comes against me and my husband, every time he comes against the ministry where we serve, I go, watch it, punk, because I'm keeping tabs on you. I'm keeping a receipt because everything you put your nasty hands on, you're going to pay at least double back to my life out of your pocket. That is not from heaven. That's from hell. I said there is a recompense. in your worst case scenario you're getting triple paid you're getting paid from heaven you're getting paid double from hell but sometimes there are some things that are so egregious that the devil tries to do that he's got to pay it back seven times either way you serve the devil the wages you get is to die you serve Jesus you rolling in it baby in every category, spiritually, socially, emotionally, financially, in your giftings, in your ministry. He tried to come against me. I said, is this all right? It's not real organized, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> Somebody should probably put that on my tombstone when I die. <laughs> she wasn't real organized, but she was a hoot. A terror hoot. You people are like extra too, because I can't get out of Indiana to save my life lately. I don't know what's going on. When I turned 21 years old, the devil tried to take the vision out of my right eye. I got shingles in my eye. I had the worst case of shingles that my doctor had ever seen in over 20 years of practicing medicine. I had it so bad that she started quoting statistics. I'm not medical, but I know as well as you do. If a doctor starts quoting statistics, you bad messed up. Right? 21-year-olds don't get shingles usually. So we knew stuff was going on, right? And I was, I, was, I was laying in the back of my mom and dad's house. They had put beach towels and quilts over the windows because I was light sensitive. It was torture to see light. It hurt so bad. And I, I mean, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if it was day or night. I was so delirious in pain. There are entire segments of time that I don't even have any memory for. But I remember laying in that back room. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I remember laying in that back room and I heard the devil come in. Whether it was the devil himself or one of his punks, I don't see that it matters a whole lot. Somebody came in and it wasn't nice. And he said, I'm about to snuff you out. It's 2005. There is no church of his presence yet. There's no Bay Revival yet. We're just in between moves. We're in that, if you're not going to do it again, please kill me phase. And he said, I'm going to snuff you out. And I said, no, you're not. But you understand, have you ever been in such a place where you literally couldn't fight for yourself? That's all I had. All I had was, no, you're not. I couldn't get up and pray in tongues for an hour until it broke. You all with me right now? So my friend Paula, I put her in that uh, Issachar tribe, you know. She's one of those that sees a lot. The night before I had that experience that I just described, Paula had a dream. My favorite part of this whole story is the timing because God was ahead of the devil's stupid punk threats. I know I yell it all the time, but please stop being impressed with the devil. Please stop it. <laughs> he is such a joke. Stop. Paula had a dream. Paula called my phone, but I couldn't answer the phone because I was so sick. So my mother answered the phone. And Paul said, Miss Rebecca, I had a dream about Liddy. That's what she's always called me. I had a dream about Liddy. Mom said, what was it? She said, I saw the enemy walk into the room where she was sitting and say, I'm about to snuff her out. I love the Holy Ghost. I love a real prophet, don't y'all? Mama said, what happened next? Paula said, then I saw Jesus. And he said to the enemy, no, you will not, for I have need of her in an end time front line revival. You will not snuff her out. And I got, I, I, y'all say what you want to. You ain't got to believe in me. You ain't got to agree with this. Visions moving in altars. 
the Lord opened up as a, as a result of the enemy trying to take my physical vision, which by the way, you know, I still wear nerd glasses, but I can see you just fine. Thank you very much. I still have my eyesight. The scar tissue stops just short of the cornea. Every time I get my yearly exam, the eye doctor goes, what in the world happened to you? Because they see the scar tissue where it stopped and it didn't take my vision. That's in the natural, but watch it. Now when we flow in an altar, many times I'll know what the prayer prophesied because I'll see a picture in my spirit. That wasn't happening before the devil touched my eyeball. There is a recompense. So those are the tribes of the vanguard. Under the banner of praise marches praise itself, which creates the Zebulon exalted dwelling, which releases the recompense and the discernment of the tribe of Issachar. The vanguard marches first. I said somebody's got to go first. Now, they all marched under that banner, but their cue, watch it now, the cloud of God's glory was the sign that it was time to move. You were supposed to stay when the cloud stayed and you moved when it moved. Frustration occurs when you try to disrupt that sequence. If you've been called to stay, leaving will not make you feel better. It will only bring temporary relief. And then you gotta walk around the mountain again. Don't do that. But if you stay when you're supposed to go, the Lord will assure your total discomfort until you get up and move. Just like an eagle pulling out all the comfort from the nest until you get up and learn how to fly on your own, baby. Nobody's going to preach with me now. You didn't like that part. The cloud was, was the visible instruction. You see, but the combination there was both audio and visual confirmation of time to move. Visibly, you saw the cloud sit up off the tent. But God didn't expect you to only use that sense. He also caused there to be a change in the sound. You watch for the glory and you listen for the sound of the trumpet. He said, when I blow the trumpet, he said, when you blow an alarm, the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out. They will begin to make forward progress. You need to see his glory and watch where it's moving and where it's headed. But you also have to listen for the signal. All right, boys, it's time to pack up and go. You have to be willing to wait when it's awkward. I love that passage because it said if it was a month, if it was two months, if it was a year, they just stayed and kept the charge of the Lord. The, the Hebrew in, inclines that they camped down. They hunkered down and just waited. I am so convinced that one of the reasons we haven't seen more major outpourings in the United States, got more technology than we've ever had before, and more people going bah, 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 about revival than we've ever had before. A lot of chatter but we haven't had real manifestation. And a lot of the reason why is because nobody really wants to hunker down. Yeah. Waiting that long is awkward. You love John Kilpatrick today, but you never heard of him before Brownsville. You didn't hear of him until he hunkered down for two and a half years. At that time, Sunday night was the service. You couldn't give up Sunday night preaching. It was the service. Everybody told him he was crazy, but he hunkered down and waited for the cloud. He can tell that story all over this world. And people will say, we want revival. But what they mean is, watch it now. I know y'all are not going to like this. What they mean is they want to come down to the front and get him to pray for them. But you don't like it when he goes on home because he's got to preach at his church. And you didn't get your little impartation. He told you what to do. No, you want somebody to do it for you. But the vanguard tribes, they don't wait for somebody to get them in the mood. They don't wait for some prayer line to commission them. They just say, forward, march, forward, march. Yeah. 
If the cloud's not moving, we're not moving. But when we hear that trumpet and we see that cloud lift up, we're going to march. I know none of the white people will know what I'm talking about, but... Man, when I was a little girl, we used to sing a song. We learned it from the black folk, and it became one of my granddaddy's favorite songs. While y'all were singing, we bring the sacrifice of praise. Because we're white and sing loud. Why y'all were doing that? Y'all been to that church? They're always the ones that want to follow it with majesty. Ba -ba -ba. Okay. Awesome. We were singing stuff like, when the cloud of God's glory is moving, you've got to move with the cloud, move with the cloud. Real people of the presence know when to hunker down. They know not to move until he moves. But they know that when he starts moving, and when you hear that sound of the trumpet, it's time to get into action. Why is the sound of the trumpet so important? In Revelation chapter one, John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard a voice behind me that sounded like a trumpet and I turned around to see the voice and it was Jesus. His voice sounds like a trumpet. You cannot make forward progress unless you move with the glory under the banner of praise. I said you cannot make, I don't care what your little program is. You can take every speaker's sermon and steal it and preach it better than all of us have and more power to you. But you cannot make forward progress until you start advancing under the banner of praise. Why do I know that? Because this is the truth. When Jacob blessed his kids, that's a weird scripture because some of them blessings didn't sound real blessing-ish. <laughs> I like that one. You boys have an anger problem. Let not my soul be joined to y'all. Like, that's not real nice. But he looked at Judah and he said, Judah, you're the one. You have the governing authority. He's looking at the boy whose name means praise and saying, you, the scepter of governing authority, will never leave your tribe. I'll say it like this. The governing authority rests on the vanguard. We don't accept our circumstances, we change them. We don't receive attacks, we start them. I said we do not accept attacks. I am so fed up with people who rolled over under the attack of hell last year and called the attack the new normal. Let me tell you something, we will not accept the terms and conditions of the attack of hell. The vanguard does not accept circumstances. We shift them. We don't accept attacks. We start them. We do not fight from a defensive position. We're coming at you like a ton of bricks. It's the vanguard that advances. A governing authority rests on the vanguard. I'm almost done. Now I really am almost done. Do y'all feel happy about that? You okay? You know that you are in real presence, real glory, when you are advancing. Because y'all, anybody can say glory a lot of times in a pulpit. It might not mean nothing. God deliver us from using terminology we have not yet experienced because we think it'll give us a better social media footprint. Give us, a more, give us more expansion in our ministry. God deliver us from fake junk like that. See, the passage I read to you in the book of Numbers is so powerful to me because it shows you two truths about the glory. The first one is glory rests 
settles down, it dwells. Like a heavy blanket. Anybody got one of them weighted blankets? We bought one for Jeremiah because he's keeping us up every night, all night, and we got tired of that. This, the weighted blanket bought us till 6.30. We said, that's a deal. <laughs> we'll take what we can get in Jesus' name. Guess we'll sleep in when we become old people. I don't know, but it's not going to happen upon today. <laughs> The glory rests, the glory dwells, the glory settles. And it seems like it's done that for such a great, wonderful season here. Yes? But I'm noticing as I get to know more of y'all in this revival tribe of crazy remnant folk, I love it. It would seem to me that it's starting to not matter whose church you go to. I come in here, y'all wild. I go over to Randall Burton's church, y'all crazy too. It don't matter where I go. I can name all kind of y'all like, all the time. Prayer rooms that'll let you on fire before you ever got to the pulpit. It is unreasonable to expect me to preach in your church, Pastor Randall, after Cindy Duff tackles me like the linebacker in your prayer room. That's not fair. I come up praying in Spanish. I'm like, Dadgum, she done knocked the English off of me. Hadn't seen Cindy in a little while. I was like, well, it's good to see you. I just deposited a lot of snot on your jacket. Praise God. <laughs> I thank God that glory rests, that glory settles, glory dwells. But that's a dangerous position. Hear my heart. Because that's where somebody wants to brand it. I'm going to talk whether anybody likes it or not. That's where somebody wants to get a logo. That's where somebody wants to put their mark on it and appropriate the copyright. I'm just talking. Because you start thinking it's your ministry that brought it. You start thinking it was the song you wrote that did it. God will not share proprietary rights with any of us his servants. I'd rather take every album I've ever written and literally set it on fire than to thank my songs ushered in the glory. Watch it, watch it. You're not gonna like that. Folk not gonna like that. They're tools. That's all they are. They're not special. I'm not special. There were moments that God kissed a couple of my songs. I thank God for it. There were songs in the Brownsville Revival that the Lord kissed that Lyndall had written and they were wonderful and I praise God for it. They're nothing more than tools. None of us are hot shots. None of us are big shots. And if it meant making sure that you didn't think I was a big deal, I'd set every album I've ever written on fire and watch it burn. If you keep thinking they're tools, we'll keep doing stuff. But you start trying to act like I'm some kind of daggum rock star, I'll set it all on fire in the fire pit in my backyard and live to fight another day. The danger of the dwelling, I want the dwelling, I don't want you to want the dwelling. But the danger that I have to address is that if God becomes, if he comes down and he begins to dwell in that way, you might want to brand it. But at some point, that cloud's going to pull up off that tabernacle and you're going to hear his voice like a trumpet. If you've branded to the place where he was yesterday, you won't advance to, toward your inheritance. Because the same glory that settles and dwells and rests also advances and moves. You are not experiencing revival glory until there is an advancement. I feel him in here right now. What do I mean? I thought last night was such a hilarious picture of it all. Because glory was talked about, preached about, and God was praised for his glory. Then it settled down, and then people started getting healed. And there were probably 10, 15 ministers in the front ministry, and it didn't matter who it was. All we were doing was flowing with the glory as it advanced. And that is your blueprint. Listen to my heart. The days of a fire tunnel will get you there have come to an end. Thank you, Jesus. The days of believing God that Brother Wonderful is gonna come lay his hands on you 
and, and zap you into it have come to a close. There are things that have shifted in the nations of the world that will never, ever, ever shift back again. Do you understand? So your dependency on the hot shots must end today. But if you're going to make forward progress, if I was you, what I'd be doing is I'd look up and see, am I moving? Am I camping? And am I marching under the banner of the vanguard? Am I walking under the, the flag of the lion? Am I, am I of the tribe of Judah, Zebulon, and Issachar? Have I, has my praise established a dwelling? Has my praise caused the throne to move in? And is that bringing about a recompense from heaven and from hell? Am I seeing some advancement in my life? If I were you, I'd, I'd take a look where I was marching. When it comes to this region, I heard the Lord say, I have begun to pound the pavement again, says God. God says, in this region, I have established this area as an epicenter for my glory. And God said, there are currents, there are rivers, there are wells under the surface that are bubbling over with my glory. And they are about to emerge from below the surface. God says, up to this point, you have experienced that which was available readily at the surface. God says, as I pound the pavement and as you dig deeper, God says, now you shall experience that which is on the surface that is readily available but that which comes up from under the surface that you had to dig for for God says things have been pouring out and down but God says the next move the next the next advancement is that which will pour up stand to your feet quickly come on quickly quickly my God my God my God my God there is an overflow. There is that which flows up and out, and there is that which flows down and around. And God, we say yes to both of those things in the name of Jesus. I want you to watch this, though. Ha. Forward advancement in the vanguard means you're being repositioned. For many of you, that's going to be very, very uncomfortable. And I mean, I love you and I'm sorry, but there ain't nothing I can do about it. Can I read to you a prophetic word the Lord spoke to me the other day as we end? I have no idea how y'all want to end this. I mean, we'll find out in a minute, hey? Real revival folk don't ever know what's happening next. Mandarabo koshabarabanta. I'm going to read to you a word the Lord spoke to me, but I want you to take everything today. Really, it'd be great to apply this to this conference, but especially I want to tell you, the things I just talked about, I don't know what areas of your life they apply to. I don't know what areas of my life they apply to. And I have found that when the Lord speaks to me, I don't know if it's like this for everybody. Prophet Fred's probably got this about figured out. The rest of us probably don't. Come on. So for me, the Lord spoke this word to me about three and a half weeks ago. And at the time he spoke it, I thought I knew what he was talking about. And then it got all over everything else other than what I thought. And I looked at Nathan and said, I was wrong. So listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this word, but I don't want you to categorize it. Can you just be okay with not having a clue? Yeah. Sometimes surrender looks like saying yes before you understood the question. How many folk did God trick into the ministry in here? Come on, come on. My hand is up. I got tricked. <laughs> I said yes to worship leader. I never said yes to this part. God thinks this is hilarious. Somebody said, what's it like? I said, it's like firing up a hot griddle and sitting down on it. <laughs> I invite you to sit on the griddle beside me tonight. Ready? I'm going to read this word. Don't categorize it and say yes to it before you fully understand what God's saying. You ready? <laughs> God said, I am about to reintroduce myself as the God who opens that which has been closed. He said, in a single moment, I can reverse your position and place you where you are supposed to be. I am positioning you for a move of my spirit, a dwelling of my glory. But know this, no man will glory in my presence. He said, I am the turnkey. I didn't know what that meant. 
I had to look it up. Do you know a turnkey is the jailer who has charge of the keys? He said, I am the turnkey. I am the one who holds the keys. And you will find in this season that in every area where the enemy tries to deny access, this will become a time of divine reversal. Can I remind you, Isaiah 22, 22 says, I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulders. And what he opens, no man will shut. And what he shuts, no man will open. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said, I have the key of David. And what I open, no man will shut. And what I shut, no man will open. He's the turnkey. And in this season, for those who will submit to the vanguard process, for those who will march under the banner of praise, He's going to snatch you up out of what you ain't supposed to be in anymore. You're going to see that cloud lift up off the tent. You're going to hear his voice in your ear. And you're going to make forward progress. Somebody say forward march. Forward march. Forward march. Now I'm going to hand the mic off. But let me tell you this. There ain't no use calling yourself an army. Unless you have a war cry. I got to think if you signed up for the vanguard, if you signed up for the front line of an army, you're crazier than crazy, right? So your war cry is not going to be cute. So what I'm going to do as I hand this off, and we'll do whatever y'all want to do, but I'm hand, I feel like my job with the mic is finished. We're going to release one of those paint peeling war cries. And I want you to sustain your shout until you feel the shift. Can you do that? So don't stop until you literally feel something shift, until you feel the government of heaven come up behind the forward march. You ready? Are you ready? One, two, three, war cry!